Welcome to Invisible, Breaking Through the Stigma of Addiction. I'm your host, Dean Anderson, and this is a show where we talk about substance use and addiction and how it impacts our community. Uh, today on the episode, we have Shell Rimmel. Shell is a lived experience emergency service worker, and I'm so happy to have her. Thanks for being on the show, Shell. Thanks for having me, Dean. It's my pleasure to have you here. And for the first time ever, and if people are, don't know this, but the first time ever, we're going to have somebody on for an entire episode and not have two <laughs> guests. So we've decided, and, and apparently your husband said, hey, you know what, no problem, because we won't be able to shut you up anyway. So th that's a good thing. Anyone who knows me knows that one. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, I, I would just love for you to share, I mean, a, an emergency service worker, lived experience. Uh, if you just share a little bit about some of your lived experience and, um, and just, you know, why it is that you know I have you on the show. Um, I myself am an alcoholic um, mm -hmm. and I also qualify as an addict as well. And for many years, I loved to party. Mm -hmm. I think my first drink was when I was 12 and... It just never stopped from there. And it gave me some kind of a satisfaction. It made me belong. I was the life of the party. And on I went. So I, I was a heavy drinker for out my whole entire life. And it wasn't until, I mean, I've been uh, working in emergency services for um, over 20 years now. And it wasn't until, geez, well into my career that I knew I couldn't stop. I knew I couldn't stop. I'd hit that line or, or whatever happens in addiction, and I lost my husband. I lost, I lost pretty much. I was on the verge of losing the house that I'd bought from under him, and I couldn't stop. And when someone asked me, uh, you know, someone put it to me in the, in the sense that I chose alcohol over my family, and that kind of... Um, took all the anger that I had away from um, away from my family um, because they were telling me, you know, you have to go to treatment, you have to get, you know, stop this, you have to, and all the rest of it, and I just couldn't do it. And, you know, I would use every excuse in the book. Well, if you had my job and saw the things that I saw today, you'd drink too. And it's an industry, right, that... We're heavy drinkers, I think, in in um, anything to do with um, frontline work and emergency services because we see a lot more trauma than people see in their lifetime, and we see it, you know, a couple times in a 12-hour shift. Mm -hmm. So um, I try not to spend a lot of time in my mind deciding why um, I am an alcoholic or addict. Mm -hmm. I have accepted the fact that I am, and I just go with that. Mm -hmm. um, so I, you know, I know that with... With the job, I did use um, substances to ply it down and to shut my brain off at night 100%. Mm -hmm. But I'm still doing the same career today, sober. Yeah. So, you know, um, it's hard to say what kind of comes comes first. But when I made that conscious decision to, um, to get sober, I also, it came with a lot of um, embarrassment. Because mm. here I am working you know, around people side by side with doctors, side by side with the nurses. And um, nobody had any clue. I'm sure that a lot of days they saw that I was not performing as well as I normally was, but that became an everyday event. Like it wasn't just, I was an everyday drinker. And um, in my mind, I thought, well, if no one's saying anything, how bad can it be? And the only mm -hmm. people that were saying anything was my husband. Mm -hmm. So I thought I was being picked on. But when I truly took a look at myself, then I realized that I wasn't. I I I, I want to peel more layers off of the integration and working in the medical mm -hmm. field in, in, in a minute because I, I, I see the value in that. And I talk to a lot of people that work in professional settings and how that dynamic is, you know, is complicated. But I also, I, before I do that, I don't want to go past something that you said earlier. You said something about choosing the alcohol over your family and mm -hmm. people doing that. I want to talk a little bit more about that because I, I recognize that I've experienced similar things. I see it in, in people every day in this idea of choosing their substance over something else, a person, place, or thing. And, and I want to know, you know, if you can share a little bit about that experience and, and what it actually meant. Sure. Um, so the, the individual that had said that to me um, did not have a substance use disorder. Mm -hmm. Because in all reality, when you're in addiction, you can't stop. 
-hmm. It's like you can say to someone, you know, hold your breath as long as you can hold it for. Mm -hmm. Eventually you're going to breathe mm -hmm. if you're not, if, if you haven't had, um, if you don't have the tools to stay sober. Yeah. And that's what would happen. I'm, I think every addict or alcoholic says, you know what, I'm not, not tonight. Not tonight. I'm mm -hmm. not going to the liquor store. I'm not going to the beer store. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to my dealer's house. Not tonight. And then you're right there. Like it just automatically happens and you're, mm -hmm. you know, um, and so it was, it's that automatic and it was that automatic for me. Looking back on it, it wasn't as much as it was a choice per se that I chose alcohol over my family. It truly in the addiction sense, I didn't have a choice at that time, right? Mm -hmm. I had a choice um, to get help. Mm -hmm. I had a choice to, um, to look at myself, but I didn't at that point in time have a choice because I was so addicted. Yeah, I, I, I see that and what you're, you're, you're referring to is, is the, the instant satisfaction, the instant relief that comes from, so holding my breath is like, okay, I need instant relief. I can't not hold my breath. And I hear this all the time with people I work with and in and, and and my own experience, that it's like, oh, I can, I can have relief in eight seconds. Mm -hmm. Or I can have it in eight months and I've got to go and do all this work and I got to, you know, put work into my family and work into my skills and work into my what, my life and whatever. And it's like eight seconds, eight months, eight seconds. And it's, and the choice is not a choice. It's like, no, I need to, to feel better right now. And, and that's a long, that's a long way to wait. For me, it was, um, I would suffer from incredible anxiety mm. when I was, now I never drank on the job. Mm -hmm. So I could make it the 12 hours through a shift mm -hmm. and um, never suffered any consequences. Mm -hmm. And I think that's an important part as well, because although that is so scary that I could, and I'm talking about six liters a night that mm -hmm. I would drink, wow. um, and it was nonstop. I'd call those Tetra Packs um, adult juice boxes. <laughs> and, you know, give me a straw and I'm good <laughs> yeah. to go type thing. Yeah, yeah. But um, I needed I needed that. So when I didn't have that, the anxiety um, mm. was incredible, and I knew what would take that anxiety away. Sure. And working um, in the emergency department, and you see alcoholics coming in and having seizures, withdrawal seizures, I, that terrified me. Mm. I did not want to have um, a withdrawal seizure at all. So mm. I would drink. Yeah. And I think. Um, yeah, I took myself off work um, when I knew I wasn't going to be able to go the 12 hours without a drink. Mm -hmm. um, that was a line that I wasn't going to cross. Thank God I didn't um, by going to work. Um, so I did take myself off work for, I can't remember how long, but it escalated my, my drinking. And um, then I was alone. So it was a perfect storm, mm. right? Yeah. Um, I was alone. I could drink whatever. I had bought the house out from uh, my husband, so there was no one around, but I was still hiding. <laughs> I was still <laughs> hiding the alcohol bottle. I don't know. Yeah, I was still hiding everything. Yeah. God forbid someone would walk in and see. But it's just, it's a crazy, crazy situation to be in and a crazy mindset that you're in at the time. Mm -hmm. But, you know, and it, it different. My mind was set on one way back then and a different way here mm -hmm. looking back on it now yeah, yeah. it's it's uh, what i what i hear there when you're, when you're talking about the hiding is the the complete undertone of shame so there's so much shame that we're even hiding it from ourselves we're hiding it in in, in plain sight and we're like okay what if somebody shows up whatever and, and we know that what we're doing we shouldn't be doing but there's still that part where we're like oh what if somebody sees what if somebody knows yeah and it's um it's embarrassing. I mean, no, I don't think anybody, I have never met anyone, and I know I've met a lot of people that have, that's their goal in life is to become an addict or an alcoholic. Nobody mm -hmm. wakes up and wants that. Mm -hmm. um, and I think part of it is it's never going to happen to me, right? I'm going to watch. I'm going to be careful. And, and how, um, with alcohol anyway, how it is described now. Like I remember someone saying to to me years and years ago, my dad was an alcoholic and saying, you know, well, your dad's an alcoholic, he drinks, has a drink every day. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking, well, people in France have, a, you know, a drink every day, right? So the, the guidelines of, of alcohol abuse 
were a little bit skewed for me because I would see, and I chose wine. Wine's acceptable, right? <laughs> Everybody has wine. <laughs> well, it's fancy. Yeah. It's not a Wine's bottle of fancy. Ripple in a plain you... paper bag. No, <laughs> it got to that point. It got to that point, yeah. yeah. Wine out of a bucket, out of no. a paper bag. But no. at the beginning, yeah, it was something that was acceptable in, um, in my home. Mm -hmm. And now when I sit and I listen back, I listen to people talking, especially at this time of year, it revolves around that. Come over for a drink, right? We'll get a bottle of wine. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm going to have a bottle of wine when I get home tonight, mm -hmm. right? And it's everywhere. Yeah, it's everywhere. Yeah, I, I recognize it as well. And I'm trying not to be, I try not to be anti alcohol anti like I don't want to be against it because I recognize that there are safe safe uses of it but our culture is definitely has a major uh, component our subculture our you know to be Canadian means to drink beer and watch hockey to yeah. you know what I mean yeah. uh, um, wine moms you know there's a whole yep. there's an entire culture around it that really normalizes it yeah 100 percent yeah it's not not as easy as we think to stay away from it no it's definitely not but yeah. once you um there's a lot of pressure with it, I think, mm -hmm. um, or there was for me to succeed, but you just have to, yeah, easy going and easy does it mm -hmm. and just take it the, the one day at a time that mm -hmm. it says to. There is um, uh, some uh, misnomers or, you know, misunderstandings about alcohol withdrawal. Uh, people think that you, you can just stop and it's just as simple you just stop and it goes away the reality of it is is that's one of you know only a few things but one of only a few things that withdrawal can actually be fatal and it can cause seizures and, and people can can die from it so the fear of withdrawal mm -hmm. <clears throat> is a, a legitimate concern and and a very problematic for many people and you and you brought that up um, how did you end up working your way through that process um I've seen many times uh, people in withdrawal and it's crazy working where I do. Um, I didn't know where to go for help. And if I didn't know where to go mm -hmm. for help, there's a, a t everybody else does not know where to go. And mm -hmm. I didn't know, I mean, I've seen the commercials on the TV for AA. I don't even think that there were the commercials on at that time, but I had, I, I didn't know what to do. And the last place I wanted to go was to the emergency room. Mm -hmm. And um, I had a friend who also works in emergency services, and I eventually went to him and said, I got a problem. And mm. um, he helped me out greatly with that, thank God, because I don't know what I would have done. In my mind, how I got through my withdrawal, and I do not advise it, I'm not a nurse, I'm not a doctor, I... Um, should have, with the amount that I was drinking and for the length of time, I should have been hospitalized for my withdrawal. Um, I chose not to. I don't advise that, but um, mm -hmm. I took all the safe precautions that I could, right? A mattress in the living yes. room, yeah. you know, so no, no stairs. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it wasn't pleasant, but I did it that way. And a mm -hmm. lot of praying and a lot of meditation and um, I think when someone wants you to quit your addiction um, it's not going to work you might white knuckle it for a little bit and do it for mm -hmm. them but when you're doing it for yourself mm -hmm. I think it's for me anyway it was different I've done it both ways and for for me myself when I decided that I was doing it for myself um, it was a lot different than than doing it for somebody else. Nobody wants to be told what to do. No, <laughs> especially a woman. Yeah, they like to be in control. And to mm. just face the fact that this is something I'm not in control of anymore. I can't control my drinking. Yeah. That was the most scary statement ever that I had to come to realize, is that, you yeah. know, I can't control this. I can control everything else in my life, or so mm. I thought at the time. Everything in my life, I'm in control, mm. I'm, but with that, I, I was not in control. Yeah, the, the oddity of that statement is that the that I, I recognize that the drinking is an attempt at trying to find control 
of our emotions and find control of keeping myself feeling, you know, safe feeling in this way. But in the, in the, the funny thing is, is the process of trying to find control and find my routine and have my pattern and hide my bottle and know what's doing <laughs> and all that control I'm trying to control over what people think and what I'm doing, I'm actually losing control of myself and, and who I am. Right. And it's exhausting. <laughs> Absolutely. Like just exhausting. in your statement there. Right. <laughs> I saw your eyes like, roll back. Yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah. <laughs> Um, now life is so much easier. <laughs> awesome. Um, we're going to take a quick break. Sure. And we'll be right back with more Shell Rimmel. Welcome back to Invisible and this amazing conversation I'm having with Shell. Shell, I want to I want to dive right into your experience. I, I appreciate what you've been sharing so far about your personal life experience, but I want to talk about your integration um, you know, back into work and the difficulties that you might have had with working in emergency services and working specifically in the health field because I recognize talking to a lot of people, there's, you know, you already said it now, it's difficult to reach out for help when you're in a field where people are helping each other and, and that creates a lot of barriers. So I'd love it if you could talk a little bit more about that experience. Sure. I, um, I went to Westover Treatment Center and when I was there, I had a revelation that I... Um, wasn't going to keep this a dirty secret that um, in order to help other people, um, I needed to forgo my anonymity. And that's what I did. So, um, and even to this day, everybody at work knows, the whole hospital really knows on both ends, and um, that I'm a recovered alcoholic addict. And, and that's, it's important to me. Uh, for that, for patients to be able to see that, you know, life isn't just about sitting in, you know, a basement of a church doing 12 steps. It's working. It's leading a productive life. It's having fun. It's mm -hmm. not, it's not a sentence. It's not, it's not the end of the world. And for, for um, staff members or anyone really who's struggling, it shouldn't be something that we're shameful of. It should not be. Mm -hmm. um, we're not, you know, an alcoholic. A lot of people think that an alcoholic drinks out of a paper bag, lives under a bridge, you know. Sure, but we're everywhere, right? We're mm -hmm. we're absolutely everywhere, and when people need to to understand that and leave the the stigma part um, and of the equation right out of it. Mm -hmm. So. To me, it helps me quite a bit when someone comes in who's in withdrawal because I can go up to them and it's very easy for me to say, I'm Shelly, I'm a recovered alcoholic, I know exactly where you've been. Mm -hmm. And I wear um, my necklace all the time. And for some people, um, I've had patients say before when I bend over to talk to them and it's dangling there, um, that it's a sign for them. Um, and for people who it's a sign for, they obviously know what the symbol is. So it's not their first time going mm -hmm. through this. But um, I think having someone there who gets it and understands um, and is not is not ashamed to admit it and kind mm -hmm. of, I'd like to think I put a little bit of a cool aspect to being a, <laughs> <laughs> an alcoholic or addict. Nice. Um, because it is, it is mm -hmm. cool. Like how many, how many people get mm -hmm. to start a life over again or how many people, mm -hmm. I mean, we're party people, we're fun, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, there's a, the bizarro world of people in in the recovery lane, yep. you know? It's like, oh, you know, the same person I used to have fun with partying is also in recovery <laughs> somewhere there too. The same personality, same person. Man, you're weird, I, right? That, and that. Um, you might not know this, um, but it has been brought to my attention through my work and the things that I do. People have come to me and said to me very specifically, I was in the emergency room and Aww. there was and there was a lovely woman that helped me and talked to me and I say, Oh, Shell? And they go, Yeah, how did you know? And it's, so it's 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 not gone unseen, I will let you oh, know. Oh, that. that that means a lot. Okay. Um, and, and it's happened several times, just so you know. So oh, it, it, that warms my heart. Because okay. that's that's um that's why I do it. I mean there's mm -hmm. there's a couple of reasons why people come to the emergency department is one because someone makes them come. Mm -hmm. Right, too, because their boss has given them an ultimatum. Mm -hmm. You either lose your job or you get help, mm -hmm. or the people who truly want it. Mm -hmm. And um, it can, it's an awful, I don't know, because that's not the route that I chose to come to emerge. Um, however, it's, you can see it's lonely. 
And I know how when I felt when the anxiety kicks in, mm -hmm. I mean, you've got to you got to reach out there yeah. at some point in time. And it's very different when I can say to the I know how you feel. I've yeah. been there. Right. For sure. um, it makes I hope and I've always hoped that it did make a world mm -hmm. of difference. But thank you very much for telling me that. Yeah. The, the recovering out loud, you know, the being able to recover and participate in your own re in your own sobriety and doing it with some sort of transparency out there. Um, I, I've noticed is makes the big difference between having anxiety and not having anxiety. When you decided to, you know, forego your anonymity, um, so you said, you know, to go out and to be there, did you notice a difference in your anxiety or notice a difference in your day-to-day -day living when you were able to be very open about your recovery? That's a good question. I, um, I think so. I think looking back on it, absolutely. And it's something, I was always used to hiding things, right? Mm -hmm. Hide my drinking, hide another bottle, mm -hmm. hide, you know, whatever was going on in my life. And to not have to hide the fact is, is awesome. Like yeah. I, um, I don't know what it's like to, to, um, to not have anybody know of my addictive personality still to this day and in my past um but i certainly I, I do have fun with it at work i mean when there's donuts that come in shelly you know is gonna come in and you know that you better have yours first because <laughs> i'm gonna have one and i'm not gonna stop <laughs> it's gonna keep on going so um and loosening up and having fun with it okay. it's a care it it's it's something that I have to live with. It's something that is there, and mm -hmm. it's something that I've accepted mm -hmm. wholeheartedly. And for me, it might not be the same for, for anybody else, but for me, it helps me to, to disclose that. And every single day when I, when I see um, a patient coming in and struggling with, with drugs or alcohol, it's a remember when for me. It's a, mm -hmm. it's a quick reminder right there in my face that, mm -hmm. you know what, if I was to go back out, Mm -hmm. there I'd be right yeah so we've said it on the show before and we'll and it's not going to be the last time that it's said but we recognize how the anonymity piece the 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 keeping it a secret part uh doesn't uh, propel us forward in taking and get rid of stigma and shame. The more that we mm -hmm. keep it a secret, the more that we have this. Not anonymity serves its purpose. There's a part where I say, you know, if I keep it to myself all the time, then you know, and they say I'm only sick as my secrets. Uh, uh, keeping it to myself all the time can be problematic. Uh, but then going out and being able to share it openly also creates bridges and takes care of some of that shame and stigma because if everybody kept, imagine if everybody kept cancer a secret yeah yeah right true um where would we be with it right now and, and we're in this place with with addiction and in, in that realm so i i wanted to to talk about you know what it looked like specifically you know if there's any specific instance you can recognize where that was beneficial to be out in the open in the professional realm not in your personal life but in the in the work relationship um, well, I, I, a lot of times um, I have been asked to, to talk to a group of um, new nurses coming in um, for orientation. Physicians have asked um, because they want to understand. It's very difficult for someone who doesn't have um, a problem to understand what it is. Mm -hmm. um, and addiction is very, it's a very complex thing. Right, so now we have um, treatments for it, where you know we can make the withdrawal easier, um, but it doesn't solve what's going on in the head, mm -hmm. and that's the important part of it as well. It's not just mm -hmm. a one like here's the magical pill, and I have people that come in yeah. want the magical pill, <laughs> right? Right, and um, it's not about that. Yeah. It's about different different aspects and different components, mm -hmm. and I think having a medical team. I mean, we're not going to get rid of the stigma in hospitals or or anywhere unless we talk about it. Right. Right. And it's talked about. And that's what I encourage. I've always encouraged people to ask me anything. There's not a stupid question that you can ask. Ask me. And um, so I tell them a little bit about my story, what happened and um, what it's like now. We go we play little games of what not to say to an alcoholic. <laughs> 
Oh, give, your, give me give me an example. Oh, your Come blood on. works fine. <laughs> <laughs> your liver's great. Yeah, yeah that's yeah, awesome. Yeah, that's a yeah. ticket to ticket to go. Yeah. And they're doing well. Like they, yeah. I mean, looking back, even in the last six years, um, the medical community has really stepped up. I feel with addictions. It's a slow process, mm -hmm. and typically it is for anything medical because there's so many different components to it. Mm -hmm. um, but they've really stepped up to uh, engage, try to understand, prescribe medications to help, and it's really it's it's at the forefront. So now, you know, as opposed to when I got sober, there I didn't know where to go. Mm -hmm. Now there there are multiple areas where you can mm -hmm. go. You can get help um, right on online. You know, talk to an addiction um, doctor right online and he'll help you out, set up every single thing for you that goes into place or you can come yeah. into the emergency department or addiction services. It's it's incredible the way that it has, the way that it has gone. The one thing that we just can't forget is that it's not just a matter of taking a pill. Right, it's not like with a right. diabetic, you know, you take your insulin, mm. you'll be just fine. It's also diet change. But the person, it's, yeah, but the person with diabetes also needs some emotional support and yeah. some coping and some well, understanding an and some yeah. and some learning yeah. and some learning how to change the things. So, uh, absolutely brilliant, and I love the way that you say, you know, it's not just a biological uh, a component. Mm -hmm. There's a psychological, a social, a spiritual, emotional, financial. There's all these. I other think it's pieces. one of the complex. most complex. Oh yeah, by yeah. far. Yeah, it's very complex. But at least it's being, you know, baby steps. It's being recognized as for what it is, okay. right? Now. Okay. So yeah. um, if you can give, you know, the people at home a bit of advice, one quick bit of advice, what would it be? What's the one thing you would tell them to do? If you're struggling in any way, please don't have any shame. There's no shame. Just, you know, just utter the couple words I need help and people know mm -hmm. people know as soon as you say I need help they're not going to turn to you and say with what <laughs> I can guarantee <laughs> you they can yeah yeah um yeah and if you don't have anyone that you can say that to come into the emerge right yeah and uh, one thing that I appreciate that wonderful advice and one thing that I don't think people realize is that um you know people feel good when you ask them for help so, and thank you very much Shel, for being on the show. I really appreciate you being here and sharing thank all you. your wisdom and your experience. And I'm sure there's more conversations to come. Oh yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you for watching Invisible, Breaking Through Stigma of Addiction. We'll be right back after this break. As we heard in today's segment that sometimes even professionals that work in the field don't know where to go for help. There's a lot changing in the landscape of medicine and how it interacts with mental health and addiction. And I wanna encourage everybody to reach out and know that there's more things happening to call those phone numbers, to do the internet searches. There's a lot more out there than you think and you're encouraged to do so. And thanks for watching Invisible, Breaking Through the Stigma of Addiction.